Don Sweeney, Bill Belichick, Hyam Bloom, and Brad Stevens, each with huge decisions to make this summer, some having ramifications that could actually last for years. All Brad Stevens has to do, <laughs> just find a missing piece or a couple pieces to get the Celtics over the championship hump. No big deal. Hyam Bloom must decide to trade some of his beloved prospects to make a playoff push. Bill Belichick has to figure out who's going to call the offensive plays. And Don Sweeney, perhaps the busiest. He has to hire a head coach, fix a depleted roster, and figure out what to do with David Pasternak and his contract. That is today's deep dive. We are going to take a look with Phil Perry, Amina Smith, and Chris Forsberg. John Tomasi is going to join us in a second. Kind of where everybody stands right now and where the most pressure is at. So we are asking the question, which GM has to nail it this summer? I chose, and this might surprise some people, but I chose Bill Belichick. Because I think that if you don't hire or you don't name an offensive coordinator that can handle Mac Jones and have this team start to take a step forward, Robert Kraft, Phil Perry, has already expressed his displeasure with the way that things have been going and his impatience. People aren't going to sit around and be like, oh, it's cool that you get your butt kicked by the Buffalo Bills every year in the first round of the playoffs as a wild card team. I also don't see any major seismic moves happening with Bill Belichick, nor do I really see it with any of these GMs anytime soon. I would say in terms of the decision that Bill Belichick has to make, though, most of his decisions are done. The guys that are here are here. It's Joe Judge. Looks like he's coaching the quarterbacks. Matt Patricia looks like he's coaching the offensive line but might have a bigger role as we get closer to the season. I think the decision that he may have, Bill Belichick may have, is do I decide to have an even bigger voice? I think he already has a big voice in terms of what's happening offensively. But at some point, maybe he has to say, okay, I need to do even more because things – maybe aren't going the way that he envisioned them. So that, I think, is the choice for him to make. Uh, my outfit twin, uh, who, who needs to – they had to separate us, by the way, because we looked, Same color. We, we looked, looked ridiculous sitting thanks, next to each other. Thanks for the text letting me know what yeah, the – Yeah, sorry. The, next the, time, the, even, the even, our, even Jeff Garcia is on the gym cameras <laughs> or in the same color today. I mean, who are you watching? Who are you looking at and saying, you got to get it done, man? I, I would say Bill Belichick has to get it done. I mean, Phil, you make a great point when you talk about the offensive coordinator, especially developing Mac Jones as a quarterback. But I have to go Brad Stevens – only because this Celtics team that got so close to winning an NBA championship. Fans are just, they're drooling at this point because of what this team has done this past season. And Brad Stevens alluded to it yesterday. He talked about how fragile it is, just trying to balance adding a new piece, knowing that, you know, you want to fix the turnovers, you want to fix the offense, you want to get somebody in there that can score, but you don't want to tinker too much with a team that's already made it to the NBA Finals. So I would say Brad Stevens has the most pressure when you talk about, you know, just making those decisions this offseason. I think there's a pressure on Brad, but he did most of the heavy lifting last year. He had to hire a coach. He had to get the, the this roster right. He had to extend Robert Williams and Marcus Smart. I think it's a little bit easier this offseason just trying to find the right pieces to put around those guys. And so it's not quite the heavy lift. For me, it goes back to Belichick because 2018 feels like years ago since you get out of the first round of the playoffs and people around here just aren't patient. And I don't care what you've done. It's always, what are you doing next? We see that with the Celtics. Everyone who comes up to me now in the streets, they're not asking what happened in the finals. They're like, what's next? Like, this, everyone's already forgotten about what happened five days ago. It's about what happens over this. To me, though, it's Stevens at number one because they're so close to a championship so close, that so it's close. one move or two moves to get you over that hump. Whereas I think even the most ardent Patriots fans would say, they're not Super Bowl favorites this year. He's my 1A. I just feel like with the Celtics, people have a little more patience with them. And there's an idea that, you know, it's not easy to win that that first one under this regime. And, like, you have time, right, where it's starting to feel like maybe Belichick and the Patriots and that that regime doesn't have as much time on their side. But you mentioned, Chris, that it's not a lot of heavy lifting for Brad Stevens. But is it almost more difficult to find that, like, that piece that puts you over the top? Like, you have your stars. You know who's great. Now you've got to find the right little, like, the final pieces to that puzzle. Yeah, for sure. And there's a pressure that comes with that. You, I feel like what Brad does this summer is so imperative to whether they're a title contender in 2023, in 2024. Like, you don't get many swings of the bat right now because you have that $17.1 million trade exception and you have to maximize and you've sacrificed a lot of second round picks along the way trying to figure out just the best way to, to keep that and use that and keep rolling it forward. So I do think there's a pressure with that. The other thing, though, is this starting five was really good, and I, I feel like they're, as much as we obsess about the Bradley Beals and we sit here and say, oh, he's got to find the right guy, it's just a little bit of a talent infusion on that bench should put them in position to be competitive. It's the if he can go to the next level and find the right guy who fits perfectly, who just gives them that extra piece, then, yeah, like it, 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 it could be. We could look back and say this was the tipping point of the Celtics being a legitimate, like, 
I don't want to say dynasty because you got to go out there and win it, but like a perennial contender. I mean, I know you picked Brad Stevens, but mm -hmm. um, I also know that you feel like, I don't know, maybe time is passing Bill Belichick by and Ooh. the pressure is on him a little bit. 70 years old. That's a long time on earth kind of coaching <laughs> the NFL. Eight decades. Eight decades. I mean, that's a long time. But I, I feel like I do have faith in Bill Belichick, but at the same time, we saw that relationship between Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft get strained a bit over the last couple of years. Even Robert Kraft, like, kind of dropping nuggets, like, in some of yeah. these pressers and some of these, uh, you know, interviews that he does with reporters. And it's almost like, okay, wait, is there an issue behind the scenes where Robert Kraft is getting a little bit annoyed at the fact that the Patriots aren't where they were, where they're winning Super Bowls, where people are expecting them to go deep into the playoffs. So when I think about Bill Belichick, I'm like, maybe there might be a timer on his time being a head coach and what, you know, people expect out of him in that position. See, I think there's a difference between voicing your displeasure at the fact that you haven't been out of the first round in some time and the coach actually being on the hot seat. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they're close to that in New England, in Foxborough with Robert Kraft. And I would just say this about the Celtics. You're talking about the Patriots mm -hmm. and maybe running out of time, Trenny, and not having the time that everybody thinks. The Celtics group isn't necessarily here in perpetuity, everybody. Not everybody is under contract for 10 years. So you have to figure out a way to maximize this window. I know these guys are young, and I know they could be around for a very long time, but you don't know that yet. And I think if you are in any way, shape, or form lax as you approach this championship you know, contention that you're trying to pursue year in and year out, then you could let that window close. I don't have high and bloom super high on the list because for one, like he's kind of new. And two, I just feel like for whatever reasons with the Celtics this year and the Patriots training camp kind of coming on the heels, like the, the, the Sox can kind of fly under the radar. But at some point, people are going to look at him and go, this is not Tampa North. You got to do it differently. You can't hold on to a ton of prospects. How do we make this team into a winner again? Because the dreaded Yankees are winning. Yeah, so I, I would put Brad Stevens first on my list for all the reasons you guys said. But I have Bloom second because this Red Sox team is looking at big changes after this year. Phil's talking about how the Celtics window isn't necessarily as large as we think. Well, Bogarts could be gone. Devers contract. We know that whole situation. So there is pressure right now. This team has been playing 700 baseball for more than six weeks now. This is a legitimately good team. Whatever was going on with them in April, they have fixed it, but there are still obviously holes, and that's where Bloom needs to step up and do something. Does he step up and do something, though, because he values those prospects? Yeah, so last year, if you remember, they made the one trade for Kyle Schwarber. They traded one right-handed pitcher who they didn't want to part with, and they reluctantly did. The list that you had up earlier, Brian Bayo's not going anywhere. He's your best pitching prospect in multiple decades, probably. But some of the other names on that list, Jaron Duran, you go to some of the players in the lower minors. I would like to see Bloom start to dig into that prospect inventory because we know what this team needs. You need help in the bullpen. Yeah. If you add relief help to this team, you are talking legitimately about a contender. Well, you also know that not all these guys are going to hit, too, right? I mean, we just talked about the Mookie Betts trade yesterday and the return you got on that. And Jeter Downs, Jeter Downs is going to make his debut tonight, everybody. Maybe this finally clicks for this guy. But clearly, not all of these players are going to hit. And so you do have to, at some point, pick and choose. I know it's great to have these guys in bulk and have a volume of prospects. Therefore, you have more darts to throw at the board and hope you hit a bullseye. But you got to deal some of these guys to get talent right now, especially when you're as good as you are. This is a very, this is a good team right now. I was about to say, out. why why hold on to it? If you were even close last season, and you're talking about being at the 700 mark this season, what's the whole point of holding on to it? Isn't the whole point to that's go all in? That's what the nerds do. I don't understand. In baseball, it's, Amina, it's, that's what the nerds do. Sustainable winner, Amina. That I mean, that's what that's why Bloom was brought in. It's to have a constant pipeline. And the second. You say there's a slippery slope, let's put it this way, between Heim Bloom and Dave Dombrowski. And the Red Sox right now organizationally want to stay closer to Bloom. You know what they're going to say? Well, we got Chris Sale. We're getting an instant oh, acquisition that at I do the not trade deadline. I love your article I do, on I do that. not want to hear that. But you know, you know second. we are. Okay, we have under a minute. None of us up here consider ourselves hockey aficionados, but I think we can all agree that while the Bruins have the most on their plate, they have like the least heat on them. And what bothers me the most about this, Phil, it's because the ownership does 
doesn't care. Like the Jacobs, as long as people are coming through the turnstiles for at least a round of the postseason, like they will keep Don Sweeney and Cam Neely in charge of everything, despite how they've drafted and the decisions they've made in both free agency and trades the last couple of well, years. They, and it's they, so frustrating. They are in franchise purgatory mode is what it feels yes. like right now. And they're okay with it. It seems that way, at least. They could hire anyone as their coach, and they are, unlike these other teams, it feels like they are really not close to contending no. for a Stanley Cup anytime soon. So that, for me, even though they have a lot of work to do, it does. It puts Sweeney at the bottom of the list.